Thank you, guys. All right. Well, let's get started. So it looks like this, you know, robo taxi race is absolutely heating up. Um, just this morning, Waymo announced that they're now able to pick up and drop off at the Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport, 24-7 curbside pickups and drop-offs, 100,000 airport trips served to date. They say, same time this morning, BYD announced a partnership with Huawei. This is just for advanced autonomous driver assistance software, as far as we're concerned. I'm not yet sure yet. They do talk about autonomous uh, capability, but they didn't explain exactly how far that can go. This comes, of course, after an announcement last week of um, BYD partnering with Uber, but that was just a, you know, drivers being able to buy BYD cars. Uber themselves last week announced they have a partnership with Cruise, and then Waymo said that they're now at 100,000 autonomous rides per week. Baidu announced that they're at 75,000 rides per week. But what many of us Tesla investors have been saying is that what matters more than autonomous rides is autonomous miles driven. And if you look at it from that perspective, it's 70, 70 times more than Waymo or Baidu has ever done. Um, but, you know, which matters more, right? Actual autonomous rides where you have paying customers or do you need those autonomous miles first? So this is, um, you know, lots of things happening. There's a lot of discussion now amongst institutional investors that RoboTaxi is real. Many of them still are saying it's real, but it'll come in 2040. So let's talk about this competition from RoboTaxi. And then we've got a number of other questions to ask the, the folks here. So I don't know if Alexandra is there. She's um, not. She's messaging us. Can you drop her? I can't do anything. She shows okay. as co-host, but I'll remove requesting. her. Then I'll re add her back in. Okay. Um, so let's start with you, Jeff. Then, if um, what's your thoughts about the competition, and do you have any um, kind of insights in terms of the comparison between autonomous drives versus actual rides? Yeah, I mean. Human-driven taxis are, are going away. Human-driven limousines, human-driven ride shares are going away. There are, you know, th this is what's happening. There's, you know, millions of these rides served, and they're going away. And and what's going to happen is is uh, robotic cars are going to take this business, and it's going to do it at a much lower price point. There's not going to be one vendor. There's going to be several. Um, and I think what you have to think through is yeah, it's not winner take all. And what you have to think through is, you know, do you, are you like, do you have a one year horizon? How you're thinking about this? Or do you have a five year horizon? And, and what are you thinking about when you're thinking about, you know, investing, for example, I mean, you have to think about profitability and you have to think about, um, you know, time equals zero to, you know, how long is it going to take this to get profitable? And what is the terminal profitability of it? Like, what can it get to in each of these various different models? Uh, what I like what I like about what Tesla is doing, and I have to be careful in terms of some of these uh, companies I talk about, but I would just say what I like what Tesla is doing is they're focused on uh, volume scale and economic scale. But what they're doing, like when they get it to work, uh, it should be the lowest price point per node, which you, you know, each, if you call each vehicle a node, it sh it should be the lowest price point, and uh, and they're and they're 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 driving for scale, and so yeah, I think in short, you know, this is coming, and there's going to be multiple vendors. It's not Tesla's not going to get 100 percent market share. I think, you know, and, and it just I don't think, I think people should like get out of that mode of like this is winner take all. Um, but what I would say is, I'd say they just have the most scalable solution on multiple vectors uh, from what I see. And it's really now a question of getting this very difficult to develop approach that they're doing. Very difficult, very, you know, very high barrier for entry, you know, given the approach that Tesla's doing. The billions of miles, you know, the trying to, to drive a ubiquitous approach that can work anywhere in the world. Very high barrier for entry. When does it? When does it actually start producing, um, you know, dramatic, you know, revenues? That's that's the question. Thank you, Alexander. Are you there? 
Uh-oh. Still can't hear her. Uh-oh. Go ahead, Xander. I don't even remember the question. I was trying to get Alexandra up. Get <laughs> okay. Ale- Let's get, here. I, she's on mute. Let's get she's Omar here. Alexandra Omar, here. the autonomous rides for Waymo is over 5 million uh, accumulated miles, annualized um, million miles already. Baidu has 3.5 million. And then you were talking about, you know, how many cars are actually in San Francisco? And then give us a sense of um, your concern about how far, how far ahead are they? Um, well, I don't think they're actually very far ahead. I've tried every self-driving system. I use all of them. I used Cruise until it was pulled. I use Waymo. I use Tesla. Tesla has by far the best system. I don't think there's any doubt about it. And, you know, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors and driverless people really want to make it seem like they've solved it. The reality is nobody's figured out how to make a car that doesn't require human intervention yet. So when you have services like Waymo, you can get the safety on the car good enough that it's not bumping into anything. And then instead of having to have a human in the car, you can have a remote intervention if necessary. For example, I was riding in a Waymo yesterday and had a car get stuck, it required a remote intervention. So it's really something where you have a trade-off. On the one hand, okay, now we can remove the driver. But on the other hand, we're going to be limited in how much people can use this, where they can go, what the cost is going to be of running the network, and so on and so forth. So, you know, Tesla, I don't know if you know this, they weren't actually the first EV. And even when the Model 3 came out, the Chevy Bolt actually beat them to market, right? GM had the original EV, the EV1. The Chevy Bolt came to market as an affordable EV before the Model 3. The iPhone wasn't the first smartphone. I mean, you know, Google has been working on this since Tesla was nothing, right? Uh, When the Roadster was coming out, that's when this project was started. And I think Tesla is going to win this market for sure. They're laying a very strong foundation. They're laying a foundation to build a business here, not just do a demonstration that self-driving is possible, which is great, but actually build a business. And if you look at it today, there's not one dollar of profit being made in the world on self-driving. Not one. Tesla is building a system that will actually be able to move the world to driverless. It's really exciting that Waymo is doing 5.2 million rides a year, but it's a drop in the bucket of the global rideshare market. And it's a drop in the bucket of total miles traveled in cars. So we have a huge task ahead of us, moving all the world's transportation from manually driven gas cars to automated electric vehicles. We essentially have to produce millions of these things and distribute them all around the world. And I can't think of a company uh, that's going to do that better than Tesla. So, you know, I was just sitting in the Waymo yesterday, it's amazing. Like the th- wheel is kind of jerking around. It's kind of confused. And then I have my hardware three Tesla and it's able to exit the same parking lot flawlessly with, you know, 1.2 megapixel cameras. And here this thing's got all these sensors, they're spinning around, there's a remote team watching me, and there's another team standing by to come get the car if necessary, and it still can't figure it out. And then this deep learning approach, just using cameras on a car from years ago, is able to do it. Um, I really think that uh, it's underappreciated. And just as a consumer, I mean, FSD is much more useful to me because I have it on my car. I can use it to drive long distance. I can use it to drive within the city. The amount of times I can use Waymo uh, is very limited. So if you really just think about, okay, I want to go buy a car that has self-driving capability, there is no other option besides Tesla on the market. 
And if you don't live in Phoenix or San Francisco, there is no Waymo either. So for 99.7% of the country's land area, there's only Tesla. It's the only solution. Now, a lot of people say, oh, Waymo's so far ahead, they have driverless. But I mean, just being driverless itself is something anybody can do. I mean, Summon is technically driverless. But what you, what really matters is, is the product good? Is it valuable? Do people want to pay for it? And I think you really have something with FSD where it they've picked a set of trade-offs. You can either have a system that is driverless, but there's a lot of buts. It's restricted in where it can go, how you can use it. It's high cost. You don't know, you know when it's going to come get you, so on and so forth. Compared to Tesla, they've got a system that you can own, that you can take anywhere. The catch is that you still have to supervise it. But, you know, even a Waymo couldn't go anywhere without being supervised. They still use a lot of human drivers as well. So I think right now it looks like, oh, okay, that's unsupervised and this is supervised. But really, the supervision is a completely artificial construct. The car is driving around on its own. It's making its own decisions. The only reason we have the human in there is because we don't want it to make a mistake. As the number of mistakes goes down, you saw that new Cortex facility that's going to add 100,000 new GPUs up from the current 35,000. As the number of interventions goes down below human level, you just remove the driver behind from behind the wheel. And then you've got a cost structure that actually allows you to scale because you're making money the more cars you add into the network rather than losing money the more cars you add into the network. Yeah. I saw that you had a post um, this morning, actually. You said that Waymo is serving all of San Francisco with just 300 cars right now. Tesla makes 300 cars every 90 minutes. So if they needed new hardware to achieve driverless, it would only take them a few hours to make enough cars to serve major markets. Waymo announced... Uh, last week, that they've introduced a sixth generation of their system. They have 13 cameras, four LiDAR, six radar, and an array of external audio receivers. They said that they did this. It's really, it's kind of funny how they, what they said. First, they, they removed some, um, some, you know, of this hardware to reduce the cost. But at the same time, they said that they needed all this hardware to be able to have overlapping fields of view to have redundancy. So the question is, you know, <clears throat> these guys are driving around San Francisco. They only have 300 cars and everybody thinks that they're incredibly, you know, far ahead of everyone else. How would that actually compete with a Tesla experience? Let's say that there's just 300 Teslas and there's 300 uh, car Waymos. Would, how would the two compete if it was just that? But of course, that's not what's going to happen, right? When Tesla decides to turn this on, they're going to just, you know, <clears throat> just shower the thing. We, we had this... Um, conversation at the last Cyber Bowls and asked the, the group, well, how many Uber drivers are there in the United States? And Jeff got it right with 1.5 million Uber drivers. That's all there is. 1.5 million Uber drivers. There's like 7 million Tesla cars globally. Um, you know, three plus million probably here in the US, uh, if not more. So it's, anybody want to speak to that about... Um, you know, just how how does just if if they were exact same cars, same number of cars, how would Waymo compete with Tesla, even if they're just exactly the same? Because they're driving around and they're driving people, right? Look, I mean, you know, Waymo is amazing. They're the number one driverless service in the world. So I definitely urge everyone go to Phoenix, go to San Francisco and try it out and understand what's happening here. This is a trend that over the next decade is going to affect virtually every company in the United States. So as an investor, I think everybody needs to be following this closely. And, you know, I really see them as a friend in this because this is such a change that is going to happen moving from manually driven cars to autonomous cars that it's really a David versus Goliath of the autonomous car companies up against all the sort of inertia. And, you know, I think Waymo is helping pave the way from a regulatory front. I think it's 
really great to see people actually using driverless cars and realizing that this technology can work, that it can be safe, that there can actually be benefits and actually experiencing what these benefits are. I mean, this is massive, massive progress. This is no longer a theoretical. We can now talk about what's going on in the real world. And I was talking to some Waymo employees. Um, you know, one of them said, hey, thanks so much for retweeting some of our announcements. And I said, yeah, you know, I love using the product. Great work. And he said, well, you know, I think we have similar taste in products. And he showed me his Model S Plaid. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. And Waymo employees get to work with Tesla and FSD. That's the truth of it, right? Because Waymo can't replace your car yet. You still need a car. And well, if you want a car with self-driving, the only option's Tesla. So I think really, until Waymo can challenge car ownership, they're not really competing at all in a meaningful way. I mean, maybe if Tesla gets into rideshare, they start to be more competitive. But today they're quite complementary, actually. Well, let, let's have that debate because um, you, this is a debate that I've been having with Alexandra, Jeff, and Xander, um, and you brought it up this morning, this idea that would Tesla, should Tesla, roll out a human-supervised, a supervised ride-hailing service? So just like Uber, you would order a car and there would be Jeff driving his or using FSD, picking you up and dropping you off. I just do not think Tesla should do that. I don't see the value of doing that. I think it's going to ruin their brand and what they're going for. But it seems like all four of you believe that that's what Tesla should do. And Alexander, if you're back, you're the number one uh, proponent of this. So what's your thinking? No, oh, brother, we can't hear you, Alexander. We can hear it when you clear your throat. <laughs> okay, Xander and Jeff, do you guys want to jump in? Christian's here too. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I've I've talked about this before. I think it's it's a, you have to shake out the network. Remember, people people make fun of or whatever. Some Tesla bulls are like Uber. Like, why why do we need them? Well, they have tens or hundreds of millions of customers that have that app on their phone and and our clients and have their credit card data and have all this information they know how to run a ride a ride sharing network now the question is is the ride sharing network uh human driven and at some point it goes to human supervised and then at some point it goes to driverless uh, but there's still value in gathering that data and going through those motions and, and training the system um you know in terms of how to operate in those last few feet how to how to move around cars and get to the right <clears throat> exit at an airport i mean it, i think there's some details here that sometimes people just sometimes overlook and i think a generalized ai system is going to be able to solve these things but i mean there's work that has to be done uh to solve these things so i do think that there's value in getting the net the tesla network uh, fully, um, you know, operational, up and running, get all the kinks out, get all the issues out. And then you're, you have less variables to deal with. Imagine you're launching the Tesla network and you're launching driverless at the exact same time. You've got, you know, multiple variables you're dealing with, but you could shake out the network and have a perfect network, get all the logic working, get all the corner cases understood, you know, and with humans that can, you know, behind the wheel that can rationally think and and take that variable out of the equation. So I think there's value in it. That's why I brought it up. That's why I think it's going to happen, actually. I think Tesla's going to announce it. And who else wants to jump in? I'll, I'll jump in real quick. Yeah, great conversation. I was just wondering, I just had a speculative question with with the 1010 event. And anyone could take this, Herbert, Xander, Jeff, Omar. I would love to get your 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 thoughts on this. With the 1010 event coming up, what and again, this is just speculative. Um, what do you think we do you think we're gonna see an operational um, I know this is easy, but I, just, I still want to just kind of get your opinions. Do you think we're going to see like a robo taxi app, like a functional app that could could work like at that 
period. And then what probability do you assign to ha Tesla having not not a person in the in the car, but sometime in 2025, that app operating, even if it's on a small scale of cars, maybe in a ge geography that they're very comfortable with, maybe it's even, not that it's geofence, but maybe it's on roads that are, are kind of open and clear that they're comfortable with. So A, do you think we're going to have that that app ready to roll and, and beautiful and, and functional? And then what uh, probability percent do you put on in 2025 that it's actually operating, generating revenue as a robo-taxi, even if it's on a small scale? Uh, nobody wants to grab that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll grab it, but I really want to respond to the question you asked earlier, Herbert, and that Jeff started to comment on. But um, Christian, I've been proposing this theory for maybe two or three years, and it came up again today in one or two uh, posts that there's going to start being robo taxi rides in the in Vegas. So to me, that's the best place for them to start. It's a very controlled environment super safe, well below the capabilities or the requirements and the capabilities of the hardware. And they can start generating revenue there. When it's going to start, I don't know, but I think it's technically possible right now. They're just not doing it. So that's my quick answer to your question. Um, the one, I think there's only a 50-50 chance. I don't think Tesla's decided, and I really think maybe Elon hasn't decided whether he wants humans to be the driver supervising before a robo taxi is humanless but one huge advantage of it if they do go that way and they do let humans supervise and be part of the network and get paid is everyone that's invested in fsd can start to be earning revenue for it and help build it and then over time it'll just make more and more money and eventually they'll be able to get out of the car altogether Okay, well, I, I don't see that happening at all. If um, Tesla wanted to, they could have easily launched a geofenced location just like Uber and or search Waymo and Cruise have done, San Francisco, and copied what they're doing. They didn't do that because they don't, that's not their game. They're not here to try to just do a small little pilot. Same time, why would you launch a human-driven robo-taxi network? Your brand is all about robo-taxi. And you're going to come out, I think, Tesla needs to come out as very clearly, this is a revolution. It's a change in the way, you know, this works. And that's why we spent years doing this beta testing of full start driving with basically human supervised. So to, to say that we need to do this because we need to have the final edge cases, we need to test out the app, it doesn't make sense that they would, if they did roll this out, it would be in a very small uh, area for piloting purposes, not like you would totally confuse the consumer and say, hey, Tesla's launched RoboTaxi, but there's humans there. And then months later, oh, there's no humans anymore. <laughs> that, that's just not, um, that's not the way you would do it if you're a product manager, if you're a brand manager and you're launching what something. Do you mean? That's how Waymo, that's how Waymo was launched. That's how a number of things were launched. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, understand. That's how. That's how. In fact, many Chinese companies, right, when they first launch the robo taxi, there's a human. Many Chinese, not many Chinese they all companies. Did this. No, no, no. Cruise, they, Waymo. No, no. All of them. All of them did this. Yes. The, yeah, yes, I, they did. No, I know. So did Baidu. <laughs> there's humans actually physically driving it, and then they get rid of the humans, and then there's teleoperation, and then they try to remove the teleoperation. I get that. That's their strategy. I just don't think that Tesla should do that. And that's not that's why they're already doing supervised FSD now without they're just taking a very different approach and they don't need to do that. Herbert, Look, I mean, I, go ahead. you know, so first to Christian's point, I don't think they're going to launch a ride share app. I think this event on 1010 is really focused on the vehicle unveil. And I think there's going to be some product unveils there, but nothing that's probably starting production tomorrow. I mean, maybe they'll show off these more affordable models that are start, uh, going to start production in the first half of 25. But I think it'll primarily be a vehicle unveil. But, you know, I think they should. That would have been a mic drop moment if they could say, oh, and we're launching a rideshare network, you know, with human supervision. So, you know, to Jeff's point, nobody has ever launched an autonomous service where they just put the driverless cars out on the road and, you know, never had a human behind the wheel. 
you always start by putting humans behind the wheel, and then you can remove the humans behind the wheel as necessary. I mean, there would be a lot of benefits here. People are already giving rides on Tesla uh, on, on the Uber network. They already have, for example, a comfort electric option. I think really what the idea would be here is a service built around FSD, okay? So you remember that paint it black video where they said the human is only there for legal purposes? That is the tagline of this new rideshare service. With the human sitting behind the wheel, it's legal to launch this anywhere around the globe practically. And you can still have FSD doing all the driving. It can be functionally just like a robo taxi, but the person is just there for legal reasons. And then as you say, hey, this person just sat there for eight hours every day for the last year and they never touched a thing. Then you can start to remove it or start to remove it in certain places. These issues Waymo has where they have a geofence, well, now you never have that problem. If you want to launch driverless within a certain area, you can have a driverless car serve within the geofence. If you want to go out, you have a car that goes out. You can start to get customers. You can start to test the app. You can start to build everything. You can start to see the real problems that rideshare drivers are seeing. At the same time, Tesla drivers have an easy way without going through Uber, without going through a different company, give one ride a week, show someone, and that pays for FSD. Tesla just launched the referral program where they're now giving $500 for every Tesla you sell. You know how many Teslas I've sold when I go on the Uber network and I give them a drive with FSD? And they go, holy, is that car driving itself? And before you know it, they've ordered a Tesla with my referral code, often before I've even gotten in the car. I mean, people would probably do it just to do that. You could integrate it into the app. The marketing value of just giving rides to people, and you can call a ride that's quiet, electric, zero emission, super comfortable, nice car. You're going to have USB-C ports, maybe a screen in the back, and you're going to be able to customize everything. When you order the car, you'll be able to set the temperature. You'll be able to turn on the seat heaters or the seat coolers. You'll be able to set everything the way that you want it, even set the FSD driving profile, even pick the route. You'll be in control of the drive, essentially, because the software is driving the car rather than a human. So I think they could have a super differentiated uh, autonomous service and then gradually remove the humans in places they can, maybe start at night, and you could have this sort of blended service for the, you know, since the start of this program in 2016, Tesla has all been about an incremental approach to autonomy. And I think a supervised rideshare is a necessary uh, next step before going to driverless rideshare. Herbert, in an ideal world, it would happen the way you're describing. I just don't think it's technically possible. And number one, you make a good point about from a branding standpoint, but from a branding standpoint, full self-driving is how they originally and still are calling their software package. And that's been approximately five years and it's never been full self-driving. It's getting closer and closer and now it's supervised, but that whole branding argument is kind of, I don't think it, it's possible from a technical standpoint. I'll just say it that way. Tesla doesn't give a shit about branding. You can tell just like by, you know, they, they care about your point of it. They care. And, and Omar, they care about getting scaling rideshare, scaling driverless rideshare eventually. And one of the steps along the way is to get the whole network figured out right now. Uber has hundreds of millions of customers um, on this net on their network. They have the customers, they have all that. And there's what a great way to transition and, and to get through all of these approvals by by running, you know, running the actual thing in, almost in a shadow mode with with human with the human behind the wheel. You don't necessarily call it a robo taxi. You, you call it Tesla Tesla network, and eventually the Tesla the Tesla network has options. It starts with a driver, 
and eventually the driver fades away as they get regional approvals and the system improves to a level of performance that can support driverless. So that's yeah. that's where I see and it going. You know that interview Dara Karwashai, the CEO of Uber, just gave where he said, oh, you know, Tesla will never figure out how to handle lost items. They'll never figure out how to handle someone throwing up in the car. Oh, yeah? Watch us. Let's start doing it with human-driven rideshare. Let's figure out all these little things. And honestly, I think there will probably still be a market for human-driven cars to some extent. I think most rides will probably be autonomous. But sometimes maybe you want to call a car with a driver in it to help your grandma load her suitcases into the car to go to the airport. Maybe you want someone to give you some advice on where to eat or something. I'm sure you could probably pay more and get a human-driven option. I think offering both is probably something that they might even want to do long term before, you know, you can have an optimist that comes with the car. Okay, well, very good um, arguments or debates, points. That's fantastic. Um, you know, the I, I just to be clear, I think that they can do this with a pilot, right? They can choose a, a certain defined area, pilot the app, figure that stuff out. But why would they want to restrict it to a certain because, area? Because I guess the way I think of it is this: when you when you have a incumbent uh, pro, uh, competitors in a space that are won the space, okay, in this case Uber and Lyft, and if you're trying to compete with them, you need three advantages over that to even make a dent. And if you don't have those three advantages, you're not going to break through. You're risking Tesla coming in with not a cheaper offering, not a better app, not a better, like all sorts of things. You don't do that. Um, you 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 want to make sure that when you come in, you've got <laughs> a lot cheaper, right? Uh, uh, truly, uh, the whole value of RoboTaxi is primarily the 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 uh, the, the this affordability of the the ride. That's what you want to blow everybody away. That you can get the exact same ride as an Uber, but it's going to be one fifth the cost. If they don't have that, it's an equal price point. What's what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And if it's just for testing well, purposes, is you don't the same need to price go more expensive. That doesn't stop people from riding it. No, I agree. I agree. But that's why it's limited. It's in an area. That's not something that they can, if they want to try to compete, truly compete and try to have a profitable business, they wouldn't be able to do it. We just talked about that, right? That's why they need to get the price up too high. It just is just for tests. It's just play. It's a play thing. But well, look, okay. I mean, it's pretty yeah. simple. You know, we want to send the cars out and see how they do. Now, if we have a human driver there, if they make a mistake, then the car still won't crash because the human will stop. It'll give us data. It's walk before you crawl. Send it out. Yeah. And I don't think I don't think people really realize how good the software is with 12.5 on Hardware 4 today. Like you can see one of these videos I put out where I just went into Los Angeles, which is some of the craziest driving you've ever seen. And I just did ride share for an hour and the software handled everything. At one point, I had to help it reverse to get out of a parking lot because it can't reverse yet. But that's coming in the next update. So this software can already do hours of ride sharing without intervention, and it's only getting better. These humans who are sitting in the car are just going to be sitting there. They're not going to be doing anything. You just said my point this then. Is a robo taxi dress rehearsal. Yeah, instead of um, launching it with human supervised, you can have supervised teleoperation. You can have you know humans in the call center managing this uh, on your behalf. So it still appears just like Waymo and Cruise. This appears like it's robo taxi. They don't realize that more than fifty percent of these rides are actually being teleoperated by a human. So no, that's what you would do. Teleoperation does not work. So. You know, I think at some point when you have things solved to the extent that it's not going to crash, it has that foundation of physical space that it knows how to not hit anything. You can then get it to the point where you can go to remote operators for any thing that does need help with. But I think, you know, that's essentially the point that Waymo is at, right? So you just start with humans. Once the humans aren't doing anything, you notice the human is never taking over to prevent a crash. It's been months. It's never happened. Well, then you can move to having them outside the car and being able to intervene remotely. That is a driverless service. 
Herbert, if it is incremental, one of the nice things is we have approximately three and a half million beta beta riders in the U.S. and these are the current Tesla owners. So I think there's a lot of Tesla owners that not only would be willing to drive, but I think there's way more that would be willing to be passengers with someone else driving, especially if they're out, if it's, especially if it's just kind of convenient for them. And there's one other thing that I don't know if they'll do this or not, and that is there's places where because of a, not, not enough saturation, Uber and Lyft aren't there yet, but there are people that own Teslas that are in those areas. And those people could say, hey, I'm, I'm willing to, to be a supervisor of my car for, for two hours, so I happen to be available. And some other um, people that have the app and just like, hey, um, I've either got to catch the bus, do a taxi because or a taxi because Uber's not here. Let me just see if Tesla's available today. And if it is, great. If not, they'll do a workaround. But that's another possibility or possible option that they get if they, they go this route. Uh, absolutely. Um, I got a quick question for Omar. Um, Omar, I know you're immersed in this space, autonomy, you, you know about Waymo, crew, all that. Um, we spoke about it last week. The Uber cruise deal, real quick, if you want to just give me your opinion, because I, I don't know exactly what they're doing. Is this just like a stunt, like a promotional headline? Or like, what is your reasoning? What does Uber get by partnering with Cruise? Other than the obvious, like, unless we think Cruise is solving something what does uber get other than an announcement and what does cruise get from uber in this deal like can you go down like maybe a layer or two or do you have any insight into what they're actually trying to accomplish by this partnership yeah good question so you know uber famously had a self-driving division which they did with uh mark lewandowski who left from waymo he founded a company called auto they acquired it that led to the famous Google Uber lawsuit, which ended up in Google winning and getting some Uber stock. Lewandowski almost went to jail before Trump pardoned him. I mean, man, the autonomous world is pretty crazy. But then Uber eventually had to sell that autonomous business to Aurora. And now, uh, that was several years back, they now have no autonomous tech of their own. So Uber under Dara has really tried to position themselves as Look, we don't care who wins the autonomous race. Just come in to our network. So Waymo is has announced a deal with Uber. You can sometimes call an Uber and get a Waymo that comes and answers the ride in Phoenix, I believe. And now they've got a deal with Cruise too. This lets them kind of position themselves, I think, to investors in the market and say, hey, look, we don't care. We'll send you a Tesla. We'll send you a cruise. I mean, sorry, not a Tesla. We'll send you a Waymo. We'll send you a cruise, maybe even a Tesla if it's available, if Tesla would let them. But they want to be kind of this neutral operator that takes any self-driving car. Now, cruise is still reeling from the destruction of the company, essentially, when they ran over that woman and lied about it, um, the departure of the CEO, the CTO, the nine top executives. They still don't have their permit in California. So they can't do any ride sharing in California. They're now trying to get up and running in Texas with human supervision. But nobody wants to open the cruise app anymore after this incredibly embarrassing situation. They lost the public trust, essentially, uh, when they had that issue and lied about it. So I'm not really sure. You know, I think there's possibly a risk to some damage to Uber's reputation if all the self-driving cars on their network aren't top-notch. The lawyers have essentially taken over a cruise now, the GM lawyers. So I think Cruise really needed this deal with Uber because nobody's going to open the Cruise app and call a car. Um, but I'm not sure, you know, how big the scale of this will really be. I see Cruise as a company whose days are really numbered. Um, they're far behind Waymo, certainly. They're far behind Tesla, and they're burning quite a bit of cash. So as long as GM is willing to continue to fund it, they'll stay alive. But it's going to become increasingly clear that this technology is not competitive and that they've lost the executives who made the company what it is, and the company is now being run by GM lawyers. 
I think it's a brilliant move on Uber's part. And for all the reasons that Omar mentioned, plus it gets more exposure for Uber Eats and Uber might end up making a deal with the Tesla bot where they're being able to do extra things. So for example, um, someone can order the robo taxi and that robo taxi can have a robot in it and it can go in and get someone's package or get their food or things we haven't even thought of yet. Like for example, go and get a kid's kid, uh, get someone's kid from school and escort the, the kid to the car and, and drive away with them and so forth. Did you guys hear uh, last week, a Chinese automaker CEO, can't remember who it was, it was a very small one, so not a company that we would recognize. He came out and said that he's appealing to the other Chinese automakers saying that there's really only gonna be three winners in the autonomous game, and that's going to be um, Baidu, Huawei, and Tesla, because it requires significant, you know, billions of dollars. And so he's basically saying, please, everybody partner with Baidu to to um, to give them the best chance of succeeding, something like that. Uh, what do you guys think about that? Who are the potential, um, you know, winners in the space? Now, again, I think we all agree there's not there's not going to be just one winner. There's going to be multiple that can play, but there's going to be significant winner takes most scenarios. And so whoever can scale the most is really the one. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I'll go real quick and then Omar, you can go. Um, I'm fascinated. Again, I'm not an expert in this, but like we know Waymo you know, we see them doing it like, like Omar was saying, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's in a small areas, Arizona, whatever, San Francisco, but they are, I guess, generating revenue and they are operating it now. And it looks like if I'm wrong, I, I think they're going to give more money. Did, did Google say they were going to invest more money into the Waymo project, Omar? So uh, like, so even if Tesla solves it, and we had this conversation again last week that they'll ramp up millions of cars because there's still going to be geographies where there's not many Tesla's around until they really scale over the next, you know, two, three, four, five years and get into the, you know, millions and millions, like five, 10 millions of cars. So do you think there is a future uh, for Waymo in the ride hailing game that they could eventually get profitable in certain areas and function, even if Tesla were to solve it and also operate a robo taxi. So my, 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 my gist is, does Waymo have a future if they could just keep refining their system, even if Tesla gets there, that Waymo could operate a service profitably and be a business? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think Waymo needs a fundamentally different business model to be profitable. Even assuming there was no gross margin loss per vehicle, even assuming their OPEX was less than their revenue, it's very difficult to compete with Uber's asset light model where, you know, drivers bring their cars and bear all the costs and, you know, Uber just pays them a fixed percentage. It's very difficult to compete with that model when you own every car in the whole fleet. So I think in order to become a profitable business, Waymo would probably have to either A, do some form of licensing, which is difficult because their product requires HD mapping within a certain area, which doesn't work well for adding hardware to a product that's going to be sold nationwide or even internationally. Um, but that would be one option is licensing or B, figure out a way to sell cars to people. Um, that they could own and then sort of operate on their own with them trying to just sort of manage their own fleet and the cars are six figure cars the balance sheet is going to look really heavy and the financials are going to look not so great compared to uber's model of just creating a market and taking a share of the traffic so I think the kind of model Tesla's proposed where you have maybe Tesla operating a fleet of several million cars, but you really have the ability to sell the cars and allow others to add and remove supply from the market based on market conditions. I think that's really the model that's needed to tackle and replace Uber with an autonomous product. 
Hey, Omar. Um, great discussion. Uh, wh what do you think about um, the insurance uh, for um, both uh, on-fleet Tesla-owned vehicle versus um, Tesla owner's vehicle, which may be able to put their vehicle onto the Tesla network? How would insurance work for these two cases? Would we need new insurance policies created for autonomous operation? Good question. So the way it works for Uber is they insure you for every trip that's included in their cut of the ride. And they essentially take out commercial insurance that covers all the time when you're driving around, when you have a ride that you're doing for Uber. So Tesla would work the same way, either supervised or unsupervised. Your personal insurance wouldn't be um, at play when you're doing ride sharing the commercial insurance covering that ride share would uh, cover any damages that occurred during that period. When you say commercial, you mean Tesla? Yeah, so essentially Tesla takes a cut of the ride, then they take out an insurance policy and they use you know a few dollars from that ride to pay for the insurance policy. And they work with some company that's able to do it and assess that risk and... Um, you know, essentially just Tesla's buying the insurance policy instead of you. You're just giving them a cut. You don't have to worry about the details. But if you had a claim while you were doing ride sharing, you would uh, file that claim with the Tesla network. Great, thanks. And a quick follow up for 12.5. Um, is that now unified stack all across the board or there's still um, like, uh, like parking is still separate? Well, right now they haven't moved the highway stack to end to end yet. So that's supposed to happen in the next 12.5 update. Circling back to insurance, since the rollout has been so slow for Tesla insurance across the US, the fact that Tesla is so financially stable that from a financial standpoint, they can take responsibility for any robo taxi vehicle that's out there. The issue is right now they don't have the infrastructure in place for most of the states where a claim could be filed and it could be managed and processed and everything. But um, yeah, that's kind of been on my mind, the fact that it's been, they've had so many headwinds in terms of getting Tesla insurance across all 50 states. Yeah, basically they're just losing a ton of money in the states where they do it. And they're not trying to make money selling insurance. They're actually trying to reduce the price of insurance and make the marketplace more competitive so that people will buy their cars. And so they're losing a bunch of money. They're targeting the most populated states, but it probably doesn't really make sense for them to spend a bunch of money hiring an insurance team in Nebraska when there aren't too many cars there. And you know, in many states, you can't even buy a Tesla uh, due to the laws against direct-to-consumer sales. So I think they will expand insurance eventually. It is really important for autonomous. It is a way to actually monetize the improvement in FSD because you can sell them insurance and then drive down the risk, drive down the loss ratio through improved software and keep some of that and pass the rest on it uh, in savings to the consumer. So I think it's an important thing to expand long term. But right now, when the business's margins are contracting in the core business, it doesn't really make sense to expand insurance. What I would suggest they maybe do is buy a national insurance provider, like buy a Lemonade or something like that, that's already licensed in all 50 states and just then you're good to go. And I think it's also a separate issue, isn't it? So if they were to do robo taxi, they don't need this insurance per state, is my understanding. They can create a separate kind of insurance for those rides. These insurance per state is for people who buy the car, and then they can bundle it. Um, Jeff, maybe you can speak to this, but we did a show where you showed that because you have Tesla insurance in, Ch in Illinois, Chicago, near Chicago where you live, and then you've been using FSD so much that it actually reduced your insurance, Tesla insurance, by $100 a month. Um, that is a separate thing, right, from the robo-taxi insurance that uh, people are referring to, correct? Yeah, 
I think it goes back to that loss ratio of FSD uh, drove my driver score up, and your driver score is this, you know, um, it's this equation of like what how how good of a driver are you, and what kind of situations do you put the car in, how much risk is there, and yeah, my situation, you know, Tesla insurance, you get it through the app, it starts you with a ninety driving score, which ain't that good. Uh, and you know, and it gives you a premium and it looks at your mileage and it looks at your driving score. You don't have to drive like a grandma. I don't drive like a grandma. I, I have, I have, you know, I, I buy the faster Teslas and I drive them fast. Um, but yeah, it was through FSD though. I was able to, to, to get my driving score up to now a hundred. And just as, as it was stepping up every month, er, the driving score was 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 improving every month. My premium was coming down, and on my X Plat, I started at a hundred and like sixty five or seventy a month, and now I'm down to ninety three. Uh, so it's essentially almost paying for the monthly cost of of FSD, and I I, I think that's a, a powerful combination. Uh, so yeah, I'm a I'm a big fan of it. I think it's something that they can scale, but you know, we're right. They got to get it. You know, it's got to be profitable. I don't know if they've, what they've broken out and what they've, what they've shared, what they haven't shared, but um, yeah, I, I, I think this is where Tesla's is going to enter another category, get, have access to data and scale that others don't have. And they're actually going to be able to, to bend the arc on and, and change the equation and improve it and then take the cost structure down for consumers and, and give them a better product. So I'm, I'm really optimistic about it. I, my experience has been great so far. I haven't had to put a claim in and, and, you know, to be, to be very transparent, but so far my experience has been great. I, I love it. And uh, I think there is, I think there is something here. Uh, it's just something that Tesla has to scale. I couldn't agree more with what Jeff's saying. There is something related I just want to throw out for the discussion. It's that many Tesla owners' insurance has gone up if they're not under Tesla insurance. And it's because the data is in, and on average, a comparable non-Tesla versus a Tesla vehicle costs 20 to 30% more to repair. So rates are starting to go up for all Tesla people. And I think Tesla insurance is the only thing that's really going to solve that, at least at this moment. That's what my expectation is. Okay. And what do you guys think about BYD? So famously, they've said that, um, you know, last year, 2023, they said that self-driving technology is basically impossible, but that they're going to invest $14 billion in smart car technology. And today they announced a partnership with Huawei for this advanced autonomous driving system. And then, of course, they announced a partnership with Uber last couple of weeks ago, but that was just to let Uber drivers outside of the United States to buy BYD cars. Um, what do you think about that strategy, BYD? I mean, they could be developing autonomous um, software. We just don't know. They could be working on that, but that's not what they said last year. Um, they could also end up partnering with Baidu instead. They could, I mean, I, they could have partnered with Tesla, but it didn't sound like it based on the way Elon replied on a comment. I can't remember exactly what happened, but what do you guys think about that? I mean, BYD makes a lot of really low cost cars and also some luxury models as well but mostly a lot of low cost cars that they sell to commercial fleets and mostly gas cars, honestly, plug in hybrids. They stopped making pure gas cars a few years ago, but uh, most of their sales, the majority are still plug in hybrids. So I don't necessarily see them as solving autonomy or even attempting to solve autonomy. They wouldn't be announcing a deal to work with companies like Huawei if they intended to do it internally. So I think they know what they're good at, and it's not machine learning. So they'll use whatever autonomous solution is out there, maybe Huawei's, maybe even Tesla's long term. But um, I don't see them as necessarily solving it. They may benefit in the sense that 
if autonomous cars make vehicle hardware a commodity and it's sort of a race to the bottom, they may be one of the more competitive manufacturers. And if you can take any car and make it autonomous, then maybe they do have a role to play there. But in terms of actually solving autonomy, which where I think is where most of the value will be, I'd be very surprised to see them create a working autonomous solution. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.